Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to First Church of the Nazarene. We're so glad that you're here with us this morning. Let's stand as we begin our worship with Forever Rain.
glad that you're here this morning. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love for us, and thank you for the privilege that we have coming into this place today. Father, I know that as we come in, we're distracted, we're facing the realities of this life, and I pray that for a little while, that you will help to calm those voices, that you will help to calm the anxieties, and remind us of who you are. And may we spend our time looking at you. May we spend some time being aware of who you are. And in that time, would you speak to our hearts? Speak deeply to us the message that we need to hear. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. And you may be seated. Well, we have several announcements as we get started this morning. Uh, first of all, uh, ongoing announcement. Just uh, letting you know that uh, we're looking at doing a, a facelift for the church. Um, a couple of pieces. The first piece is a metal roof on the gym. The shingles have been falling off of that since I got here eight years ago. And so it's probably about time to, uh, to get those replaced. We're going to put a metal roof. Um, the second piece is we're going to reconfigure the stage a little bit. We're actually going to build a wall and make the stage a little bit smaller. Um, this stage was built really big. Um, so we're going to make it a little bit smaller. And then we're also going to address the emergency exits on the side so you'll be able to get to the emergency exits uh, without having to go up steps and down steps. Um, and then also looking at new carpeting for the sanctuary. Uh, this carpet, uh, I think we figured was about 28 years old, uh, somewhere in that range, and uh, it's showing its age. Um, the total cost on this project is going to be about $20,000. Uh, we recognize we may or may not bring all of that in to start with, and so we have some stages, some priorities of what needs to be done. And the first, of course, is the roof, uh, recognizing that, uh, that that needs to be done first. Uh, the second priority will be the stage and kind of getting the emergency exits open back up. And then the third priority of that is the carpet. So on March 25th, we'll be taking a special offering, and we're giving you a little over a month to be praying about this, thinking about it. If you have questions, feel free to ask me. Uh, this is something that the board's been working on since about September. Uh, it's not something that we've come at quickly, uh, but if you've got questions, feel free to ask, and I'd be ha happy to answer those questions. On April 1st, it is Easter. Now, having... April's Fool day, Fool's Day and Easter on the same day could be interesting. My girls are getting pickles for Easter. They think I'm joking. Um, but a part of Easter is uh, we do an Easter egg hunt here. I did, uh, Jerry, I think you posted on Facebook of something about make kids go hunt for eggs you didn't hide. We're not going to do that. We're actually going to hide the eggs. Um, but we are collecting wrapped candy. Uh, so between now and March 25th, if you want to bring in wrapped candy, and then uh, we'll get that ready for the Easter egg hunt. If you would like to purchase an Easter lily, uh, we do decorate the sanctuary with Easter lilies at Easter. So if you'd like to purchase one in honor of or in memory of someone, uh, go ahead and fill that out. The due date is March 25th on this. The bulletin actually has a different date. The, the flyer is correct, March 25th. If you go by the bulletin date, it'll be after Easter. We don't want that to happen. So if you could turn that in as soon as possible, just go ahead and put the $8 uh, with the form, and then we'll get those, uh, get those ordered uh, the week of the 25th. <coughs> our Easter schedule uh, will start as normal with the breakfast at 8.30, and then we'll have our adult Bible study and the children's egg hunt uh, going on at 9.30, and 10.30 will be the children's church and the regular Easter service. So it's going to be a busy day, but it's going to be a great day as we get together, we fellowship <laughs> together, and we celebrate the risen Lord. Next weekend is daylight savings time. Is anybody excited about this? I watched the, the news last night, and they were excited about this one. Now, I'm excited about the one in fall simply because I get an extra hour to sleep, or in my case, to work on my sermon. But I'm never excited about the spring forward. But they were saying how nice it's going to be to have extra hours of daylight I'm not fully buying it, but anyway, next Sunday, whether you like it or not, you lose an hour. So uh, make sure that you set your clocks an hour forward before you go to bed Saturday night, and we'll send out a call them all message to, to let you know about that, to remind you about that. All right, and next is quizzing. 
Yesterday, our quizzers traveled to Burlington, Iowa, the big city of Burlington, and were able to participate in the zone quiz uh, for our zone, our part of the state of Iowa. So if the quizzers and their coaches would come on up. And we have a couple of pictures that will kind of cycle in the background as you, as they come. All right, our quizzers did a great job yesterday. Uh, Julie and Leah have been working with them all year. They've been studying, what book have you been studying? Have you been studying Acts? Matthew. Revelation? Matthew. 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 Well, at least you got that part right. Good job. <laughs> They've been doing an excellent job, and it's always fun to watch them quiz. You have a question about the book of Matthew, which we're going to be studying as a church starting not this week, but next week. Um, then you can ask these quizzers because they've studied it really well. So yesterday was the zone quiz, and if they scored a, or only missed a certain number of questions, then they get to go on to the next level. And three of our quizzers get to go on to the next level. That is Ava and Avery and Dylan, all qualified to go on to the next level. But Marlena and Kennedy did a great job as well. They did phenomenal, and we're very proud of them. So uh, they all earned medals, and they got different colored um, pins on, the, on there. And then... Avery and Ava both scored a perfect round, which means they didn't miss any questions in a round, and so they got a gold star for that one. So let's give our quizzers a big hand. Um, we're very proud of them, and we're excited to, uh, to see all that they're learning. And uh, the other three will go on next, not this coming Saturday, but the next Saturday, they'll go to Oskaloosa to get to quiz. So we're excited for them. All right, and thank you to Julie and Leah for all your work with that as well. Thank you, guys. All right, well, at this time, let's stand together as we continue to worship.
Well, as we come into this time of worship today, I know that we come carrying our burdens and our concerns. And a part of the privilege that we have of being the church, of being a body of believers, is the privilege to bring our request before God. And not just to pray, because we can do that anywhere, anytime, but to be able to bring our requests before God in a, in a room full of people who are bringing their requests before because there's something special that happens when we pray together. There's something that we connect with God at a deeper level when we're able to recognize when we look around and see that we're not alone. That we're not facing the struggles of this life alone. We are working together. We're together in this journey. And so as we see through this chorus again, I would invite you to just kind of enter that attitude of prayer. If you want to be seated, that's fine. If you want to remain standing, if you want to come forward, our altars are open. But I just encourage you to enter this, this time of prayer to be not so aware of what's taking place with the people around you or all of those thoughts that are running through your head or what's going to be for lunch, but, but to really focus our attention on God and bringing our requests before Him. in fact, that you would send your son into this world to suffer the most humiliating death possible, to give us the opportunity to have our sins forgiven, to have the opportunity to participate in a kingdom that is bigger than this world, and the hope of eternity in your presence. And God, as we come to this time today, I know that we come carrying the realities of this world. I know that we all have burdens that we're carrying. And this world is wired in such a way that it takes our eyes off of you and it takes our eyes off of what you came to do for us. And instead, all we see are the challenges around us. So God, this morning, we take a few moments just to silently pray. Whether there's sin that we need to confess, whether there's request we need to bring before you. Maybe we just need to send in your peaceful presence. We take a few moments now to sign up.
God, we know that as we gather together today, there are a lot of needs. There's a lot of challenges facing us as, as individuals in this congregation. But we continue to pray for Dave and Chad and their battles against cancer. We continue to pray for those who are facing other physical challenges. Father, we lift up those who are facing financial challenges. We lift up those who are really struggling in relationships and trying to figure out how to make relationships work. We pray for those this morning, Lord, who are just feeling overwhelmed. Who are just feeling wiped out. Father, we thank you that, that you hear each prayer. You hear each cry of our heart. We pray that you will act in your will in each of these situations. Father, there are many times in this life that we just don't know exactly what to say. There are times in our journey with you that we've said all that there is to say, but yet our hearts want so deeply just to connect with you, just to know that you're with us. And so in times like these, we find great comfort and great peace in praying together the words that you're sent to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And you may be seated. Thank you. 
Please bless our offering today. For all power, honor, and praise, the glory is yours forever. The year 2018, we have designated as a church as a year with Jesus. And so we've been spending the first part of this year, the first two months, and we'll spend part of the third month in the Gospel of Mark. Now, honestly, a part of my desire in this year with Jesus was recognizing that we need to take some time to slow down. We live in such a fast-paced world that most of life actually races by without us ever stopping to experience it. In the culture that we live in, we're always chasing the newest, the best, and that Facebook image. <laughs> And so we're never taking time to actually live life. So part of my desire in this year is for us to slow down and spend some time with Jesus. To not, to not be jumping around throughout Scripture as we normally do, but to be specific in our focus. Part of my reason for that is that we tend to learn by repetition. And sometimes we need to hear the story of Jesus over and over and over again. Because sometimes we're not seeing it. It's a time for us to look at the Gospels with fresh eyes. It's a time for us to say, how would I view this story or this passage if I'd never read it before? Because I think all too often when we come to Scripture, we come to Scripture thinking we've already heard this, we've already read this, we already know this, but we really don't. Really, I want the year 2018 to be a year that, that we grow, a year that we become better, better followers of Christ, better members of family, better members of society, better members of this congregation. At this point in our gospel journey, we are wrapping up Mark. We're approaching the end of Mark's gospel. So we're in a part of Mark's gospel that we probably know better than the rest of the story. In fact, we know in our minds where this story is going to go. We understand as we come to Mark's gospel, we're, we're entering in the time in Jerusalem, and we know how this story is going to end. We know that the cross is coming. We know that, that the resurrection is coming. We know that. And we really don't expect any surprises as we're reading this. And you're probably coming to church if you've been doing the reading this morning thinking, well, I know this story. I bet pastor's going here. Or I, he's probably going here. We don't expect any surprises. But sometimes our familiarity with something it keeps us from seeing things. Have you ever noticed that? Sometimes our familiarity with something keeps us from seeing what should be very obvious. In our family, we adopted a puppy, or we got a puppy, however you say that, at Christmas time. And I want you to know that I've made it almost three months without mentioning him from the pulpit. <laughs> Although he has been consuming our lives in the last three months. 
And, and I spend time every day with Wesley. He's named after John Wesley, a good Nazarene pastor's dog. <clears throat> I spend time every day with Wesley, and I don't really notice his growth until I look back at pictures from when we first got him. And I think he's about tripled in size in the last few months. But sometimes our familiarity, just because we're with something all the time, we don't see that change. We don't see that reality. And so I want us today to look at a very familiar passage, but I want us to look at this passage with clear eyes. Now, when we first got Wesley, you could see that he had eyes. He's a, a, a golden doodle, so he's half poodle, half golden retriever. Actually, he's two-thirds poodle, a third golden retriever. So he's supposed to be a very nice, friendly dog, but he's not supposed to shed. That's the point. We'll see how that goes. He's not shedding so far. I'm not so sure about the nice, friendly dog, but he's a puppy. But when we first got Wesley, we could see that he had two eyes, but as his fur has grown, he kind of got to the point where you couldn't tell if he had eyes or not. Now, he's cute, but are there any eyes there? And I think for the last month especially, we were, if we could happen to see both eyes at the same time, we're like, oh, he does have two eyes. Well, this week, Wesley got to go to the groomer for the first time. And so you can see it's a, the lighting is not the greatest, but he does actually have two eyes. And this week, since, since Friday when he came home from the groomer, I just keep looking at him and say, oh, there's eyes there. So when we read this passage today, I want us to think about the fact that sometimes we're so familiar with stories that we may not know, we may not be paying attention to what the stories actually say. So if you have your Bibles and you want to turn with me to Mark chapter 14, we're going to read verses 10 through 26. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve disciples, went to the leading priest to arrange to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted when they heard why he had come, and they promised to give him money. So he began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus. The scoundrel of this story. Just establish that from the beginning. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was sacrificed, Jesus' disciples came and asked him, where do you want us to go prepare the Passover meal for you? So Jesus sent two of them into Jerusalem with these instructions. As you go into the city, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. Follow him. At the house he enters, stay, say to the owner, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? He will take you to upstairs to a large room that is already set up, and that is where you should prepare our meal. So the two disciples went into the city and found everything just as Jesus had said, and they prepared the Passover meal there. In the evening, Jesus arrived with the twelve, and as they were at the table eating, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, one of you eating here will betray me. Greatly distressed, each one of them asked in turn, am I the one? He replied, it is one of you twelve who is eating from this bowl with me. For the Son of Man must die, as the scriptures declared long ago. But how terrible it would be for the one who betrays him. It would be far better for that man if he had never been born. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. He broke it into pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine, and he gave thanks to God for it, and he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice for many. And I tell you the truth, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. Then they all sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. Now, this is a familiar story. Most of you are probably saying there's no surprises. We've heard this story. And quite honestly, I think we've probably heard this story more than we've heard any other story in the Bible. Because every time we set, celebrate communion, every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper, a part of this story is recounted to us. And I try as a pastor to not preach the same sermons over and over again. You may say, well, you're missing the point, but you do. But I try not to. 
But this is one that every time we celebrate communion, I try to make sure that we hear this story again. In fact, in the Church of the Nazarene, I'm instructed as a pastor to make sure that I tell the story before I disperse the elements. So maybe we know this story better than we know any story. But I want us to slow down, as we talked about, and I want us to look at this story through fresh eyes. Now the, the passage starts with the betrayal plan. Jesus has been telling his disciples repeatedly up to this point, Mark recorded it three different times up to this point, that he was going to Jerusalem and that he was going to die. All of them have heard this story, yet they seem surprised when it actually happens. But Judas Iscariot is one of the members of the Twelve. He went to the enemy, he schemed with the enemy and came up with a plan as to how he, he would betray Jesus. I've read this story numerous times, but this time as I read this story, this really hit me. Judas has been with Jesus. All the stories that we've read in Mark's Gospel, all of the miracles, all of the action that we've read about Jesus, Judas was there. When Jesus walked on water, Judas was there. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, Judas was there. Judas helped pass out the bread to the 5,000. And he helped pick up the leftovers. Judas helped pass out the bread to the 4,000. And he helped pick up the leftovers. For many of us today, we're thinking, how could anyone betray Jesus anyway? but especially someone who knows Jesus as well. How could he betray Jesus when he had witnessed all of this? And then I think that leads me to another question, because I tend to be pretty vengeful if somebody offends me and the Spirit's working on me in that. I'm not as bad as I used to be. But how did Jesus not know this? And yet the answer is Jesus did know this. But based on the way that we treat, the way that Jesus treated the 12, you would think that he didn't. You know, when Jesus called the 12 disciples, and we read some of those stories, we don't know the specifics of Judas' call. But when we read the story of Jesus calling the disciples, when Jesus called Judas' name and said, come follow me, he knew. If this were me, and I called Judas, and I sensed any bit of unsettledness, like maybe this guy's not all that he says he is, I would have excluded him from events. When it came time for, for the, the walking on the water, I would have said, no, Peter, you get back in the boat. Judas, you come here. And I would have waited just a little bit longer to help him up out of the water. And yet Jesus treated Judas throughout everything that we've read the same as he treated the other 11. In fact, this is the first time that we see this bad thing written about Judas. Now John's Gospel tells us that Judas was actually taking some money. He was stealing from the disciples' purse. And Jesus knew that too. And yet Jesus treated him the same. 
And so we come to this Last Supper. We call it the Last Supper. Jesus didn't. It's how we have termed this last meal that Jesus had with his disciples. There's been famous paintings from this. There's been movies produced about this Last Supper. There's, there's been a lot of focus on this Last Supper. It takes up a lot of the gospel story. Every gospel mentions it in some way, and John's gospel spends considerable amount of time on this last night. In fact, the chapters 13 through 17 of John's gospel focus on this night that Jesus spent with his disciples. Now, it was a very special time for the Jewish people. Passover, as they were coming together to celebrate, was looking back to the, the story of God delivering the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt. It was a special time for the Jewish people. It would be very much like um, Independence Day for us. It would be very much like Fourth of July. That we celebrate our freedom from the British troops. Passover was that special time for the Jewish people where they celebrated the, the fact that they were freed from slavery. And quite honestly, God had established this as something to be celebrated. And he had, he had prescribed to them a, a feast that they were to come together and have every year. And it was to be the biggest feast of the year. And he had four different feasts that they were to come to, but Passover was the big one. It was the time that they remembered that God delivered them. It was the time that they remembered that he brought them through absolutely impossible circumstances. To bring them out from under, at that time, the largest, the strongest, the most powerful, the most fierce empire of the day, the Egyptians. And without them lifting a finger, God absolutely decimated the Egyptian forces. And they were to remember that He was the God who rescued them. It was a chance for them to remember this. But it was also something that they were told to celebrate. To celebrate because they were chosen as the people of God. He did all of this for them because He loved them. They were His people and He was their God. Now there were a lot of regulations around this meal. And God had set many of these in place the Jewish leaders had added to those regulations that God set in place. The menu was always set. It was not a question of what are we having for Passover this year. God had established the menu. They were to have lamb, and they prescribed which lamb from your flock, and, and he prescribed the, the, the way that it was to be killed, the, the sacrificial way that it was to be killed. He prescribed the way that the priests were to to actually ask, act as the meat cutters and, and to dress the, the lamb and give it back to you. There was to be bread that was made without yeast. There was to be the wine. In fact, several cups of wine. The menu was always going to be the same. And it was kind of like that, that Thanksgiving meal for the people as they came together. When we think about Thanksgiving, it's the only time of year that I'll willingly eat turkey. And I don't like turkey um, for a lot of reasons, one of which was food poisoning, which was my fault because my wife said it's not done yet. I'm cooking it longer. And I said, oh, it's good. And she cooked hers longer. I didn't. She was right, as usual. But Thanksgiving is that one time a year that I'll eat turkey. But I'm also looking forward to something at the end of Thanksgiving dinner. And it's not pumpkin pie. It's the other kind. I don't care what other kind it is. It could be pecan, it could be apple, it could be anything. I don't like pumpkin. But there's, there's these, this menu that's set. It's these things that we anticipate that we look forward to. And that's what we do at this feast. And, and that's what Passover was. It, was. it was this meal that everyone looked forward to. And the location was also very specific. As this location was spelled out, it had to be celebrated within, according to the Jewish leaders, within the walls of Jerusalem. Everybody had to come and celebrate this meal within the walls of Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem was not a very big city. 
Most people did not live in Jerusalem. But this meal had to be celebrated inside of the city walls. So the competition for locations was actually pretty tight. And honestly, Jesus and his disciples have been away from Jerusalem before this time. They were, they were avoiding the crowds, and they hadn't been around Jerusalem to make plans. And I think we forget the fact that Jesus, when he comes to Jerusalem, he's really been, the last year or so, he's really stayed away from Jerusalem. And in order to get a house to celebrate the, the Passover meal in, you have to have some connections inside of Jerusalem. And so the disciples come to him and they say, where are we supposed to get this figured out? Where are we supposed to celebrate this meal? And I love the way that Jesus responds. <clears throat> he has it all figured out. He tells them, as you go into the city, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. Follow him. The house he enters, say to the owner, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? He will take you to an upstairs large room that is already set up. Now, I am a bit of a control freak. If Jesus had told me this, walk into town, look for the man carrying a pitcher of water. Okay, Jerusalem isn't a big city, but it's still about 40,000 people. Look for the man carrying a pitcher of water. Um, there might be a few. Now, typically in that culture, men did not carry water. That was what part of the women's responsibilities in that culture. But still, there's more than one widow in Jerusalem. And then follow him. You know, you get that feeling that somebody, you, you might have pulled out in front of them in traffic, and then you get the sense that maybe they're following you. There's this guy who's carrying a pitcher of water, and then these two guys are supposed to spot him out, and I'm sure they said, hey, that, that's him, that's him, that's him. And so they start following after him. <clears throat> yeah, it might freak him out a little bit. And, and as they're following him, they're supposed to go to the house that he enters. So I mean, follow him all the way up to the door. And then say to the person who answers the door, the teacher wants to know where he can celebrate the teacher. How many teachers are there in a town of 4,000, 40,000 people? Any guess? All of the teachers are coming to Jerusalem for this festival. So every teacher that is a Jewish teacher is coming for this celebration. And the teacher wants to know. Do you get how crazy this sounds? And yet Jesus has it all figured out. Go to town and follow the man. There's a lot of discussion as to whether Jesus had prearranged this, whether he had met with this person when nobody else was around, when nobody else knew, or did Jesus just know that it was going to happen? It doesn't matter. We could spend all day on that and not get anywhere. The point is that Jesus had it figured out. It just so turns out that the house that Jesus sent his disciples to was the house where a little boy lived, probably a teenager, by the name of John Mark, who wrote this story. It just so happens that Jesus knew that the first gospel that needed to be written, this little boy who was going to write that first gospel, needed to see a little bit of this. In fact, this gospel is going to tell us, and Mark is not going to call himself by name, but he's going to say that a young man followed them as they left after they sang the hymn. And he followed them to the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, we know that things happen in the Garden of Gethsemane. We know that Jesus tells his disciples to pray, and then they fall asleep. And we know that Jesus went back, and he woke his disciples up, and he said, can't you pray with me? And they fall asleep again. And then he comes back again, and... This time he just lets them sleep. Well, who wrote that down? Maybe the little boy who had followed, who said, I know what happened when the disciples were all sleeping. Jesus came back and you guys weren't paying attention, but I was there. In fact, you're going to read 
that little snippet in what we read this week. If you read closely, you'll find out he was the first recorded strict speaker in the Bible. I'm not encouraging that activity, I'm just saying it's there. So the Last Supper. If you can imagine they're all together celebrating, and Jesus brings up a tough conversation piece. First of all, the disciples clearly did not like it when he talked about dying. In fact, Peter had been so emphatic that Jesus told him, get behind me, Satan. They didn't like it when he talked this way, but he always talked this way. This news of betrayal was even harder for them to hear. To understand that Jesus said he was going to die is one thing, but to think that one of them was going to do it? And they're, of course, looking around the table, but more importantly, they're looking at Jesus and saying, it's not me, is it? And here comes back to that sense of the scoundrel. Whereas I would have called him out, humiliated him, Jesus didn't identify Judas. In fact, when Judas left, John's Gospel tells us because he was in charge of the company purse, he was the one who had handled the money. When Jesus told him to go and do what you have to do, they all just thought he was going to pay the bill for the meal. They didn't catch, they didn't connect this betrayal with Judas. Here's what I want us to see as we look at this last supper. Jesus welcomed everybody to the table. In our culture today, I think that Christians spend more of our time trying to determine who should be at the table with us to the point that we never get to enjoy the meal. We spend so much of our time as Christians judging one another, criticizing one another, to the point that we never enjoy the meal. I also want us to see here that Jesus practiced what he preached. Jesus said, love your enemies. He said it a couple of times. Mark doesn't record it, or Matthew and Luke do. And Jesus lived that out. Jesus said in Matthew's Gospel, do good to those who persecute you. And Jesus lived that out. In spite of the fact that there's a scoundrel at the table, Jesus makes this a night to remember. All four Gospels reference this night. We'll cover this again as we go through this year with Jesus. And it's a night that we remember and celebrate on a regular basis. This is the reason that the table is set today, that we have the communion elements to celebrate. And I want us to come to this celebration <clears throat> with different eyes. How do we remember this night? How do we remember this celebration of communion? I can remember growing up in the church, and I remember coming to this time of communion, and it was always about pointing fingers to who didn't go forward. Well, did you see that so-and-so didn't receive communion? Because our pastor would preach that if you take of the elements and your heart is not right before God, then you're going to die. Well, that's what Corinthians says. But all the attention was not on enjoying the meal. It was on paying attention to everybody else. And I want us to notice that Jesus, in this meal, invites to the table the scoundrel who was going to betray him. Maybe as a church, we would do better to enjoy the meal instead of trying to figure out who should be at the table with us. 
maybe as a church, we're spending too much time paying attention to who's doing things the way that we want them to. Instead of saying, I get to enjoy this meal with Jesus. How do we remember this night? Across the last few sermons, I've been trying to give you something to hold on to. A couple of weeks ago, I gave you a, a thing of mustard seeds. Anybody still have their mustard seeds? And I ask you the question, will you allow this seed to take root in your heart? And last week, we looked at puzzles. And we looked at the fact that I put together a puzzle, which I hadn't done for years. Well, there it went. And I gave you each some puzzle pieces to remind you that we are a part of a bigger picture and that we're to live intentionally as we follow after Jesus. And today as we come to the table, I want us to, to think about what, what can we do to remember this meal differently? As I was thinking about this yesterday, as I was working on this sermon, a thought came to my mind about a napkin collection. Does anybody here collect napkins? Nobody here collects napkins, okay? Janelle's mother collected napkins. And Janelle's mother has been, she passed away in 2004, so it's, it's been 14 years ago. And one of the things that Janelle was given when her mother passed away was her napkin collection. We don't know why they gave it to her. We tried to give it away to the other siblings. They didn't want it either. And the truth is we never even opened the box. And after opening it last night, we understand why. You can't get them all back in there. <laughs> but I brought a few of her napkins this morning from her napkin collection. Now, this is her very first napkin that she collected. It's from December of 1961, and she wrote on it, my first napkin. December of 1961. She would have been about 10 years old when she started collecting napkins. By 1963, actually March 2nd of 1963, she had collected her 100th napkin. There's other napkins here like on May 15th of 1968, this was actually a, a coaster from the, um, her Honor Society Initiation Banquet, Big Mountain in Montana, where she was from. May 15th, 1968, 6.50 p.m. <laughs> My guess is she was bored at that service. <laughs> There's napkins in here from Hawaii, Hawaiian Airlines. There's napkins from Air West, and this one said, with Grandpa C. So apparently, either Grandpa Cutting gave this to her, or she was on the flight with him, perhaps. I don't know. Then she had some funny ones. Here's a picture of a dog dressed up in a doctor's outfit. It says, let me know if this works. I'm suffering the same symptoms myself. On the other side, it says, I like work but it sure kills my social life. Now, my guess is that this napkin came from the 70s. Kind of has that psychedelic look. And then she had napkin number 200. Somebody's wedding, I don't know whose it is, she didn't mark, but napkin number 200. On May 24th of 1972, she actually tabulated her napkins. There were 111 placemats, two bibs, four menus, 13 sugar packets, five cards, 27 coasters, 11 long stirs, 46 long napkins, 144 big napkins, and 121 small napkins. In case you're counting, it's 484 napkins by May 24th of 1972. She had napkins from Whitworth College, where she went to college in Washington. There was a couple of napkins from her wedding in 1974. 
there was a napkin from Memorial Hospital in Colorado Springs, which is where Janelle was born. I didn't know hospitals printed their own napkins, but this is the one from when Janelle was born, 25 years ago. <laughs> Here's one from Yellowstone Park. It says, as a Yellowstone bear, it's my delight to scratch and bite. Look out, I might, so stay in your car and look from afar and keep your windows and doors. Keep clothes tight. So, in other words, it was a reminder. She lived in Montana. Don't play with the bears. And then there was this one. It's a menu from Happy Joe's. And there were a few in Montana. Most of the ones that they had went to were in um, North Dakota. But right here on the back, it's got this great big star and dab. So here's a menu from Happy Joe's. I also found this napkin from the Baileys, 1962 to 1987. Now I'm pretty sure that this is from the 25th wedding anniversary of Pastor Tom Bailey, who is the pastor when this church was being built. He went on to be a district superintendent in North Dakota, which is where they were pastoring in the 80s. So I think this is from the Bailey's 25th wedding anniversary. And now all of these napkins, and there were, I would guess that there were over a thousand napkins in this thing when we were looking through them last night. And some of them were marked and some of them weren't. If, if Judy were still alive, she had a very sharp mind. She was valedictorian of her class. And I'm sure she could have told us the story behind every napkin. And it's one of those things where you wish you would have opened that box sooner. There was a placemat. She worked at Hardy's for a while, so there were a lot of, you know, the tray liners from Hardy's trays. There was one from McDonald's from 1994 introducing the phrase, just say supersize it. <laughs> I said that the other day. They don't do that anymore, just in case you're wondering. They <laughs> quietly made that go away. But you remember when that came out, supersize it. Judy remembered her meals with napkins. And I want us to think about how are we remembering our lives? How are we in remembering our interactions with God? It's one of the things that I don't care for as much about our tradition because we tend to downplay the importance of this meal. And we tend not to, to celebrate it as much as it should be celebrated. And I'm guessing that many of you, especially if you grew up in a different tradition, can remember that time that you partook of the communion elements for the first time. In many traditions, that's something that's very celebrated. It's built up to, it's an exciting thing. And in the Nazarene church, we don't tend to celebrate that way. I, I wish we did, actually. But I want us to think about how important it is for us to come to this meal. But I also want us to think about the reality that we're called to the table to enjoy the meal, not to pay attention to who else is at the table. And so I have, as we come forward to receive the elements here in a few moments, I have a napkin for you. And I found, I got the, the most special napkins that I could find. They have gold foil on them. Not real gold, of course. They were only $2 a package at Walmart. But it's special. And I just encourage you, kind of like the puzzle pieces, kind of like the seeds, to stick this somewhere where you remember how important it is that Jesus Christ would come to this earth and endure the most humiliating death possible so that he could invite you to come to the table. And so in a minute, we're going to come and celebrate communion. I'm just going to set these napkins on the altar here on each side. And as you grab the elements and head back to your seat, you can grab a napkin and take it with you. And I encourage you to keep this as a memento of something to remind you of the fact that you were invited to come to the table to celebrate this sacred meal that we're called to. There are a lot of lessons in the Last Supper, and this is a very familiar story. 
Perhaps the lesson for you today is that we need to be more intentional about our meal. Perhaps we need to be more intentional about being aware of and celebrating the memories of this meal. Perhaps for you today, the message that you need to hear is a message about loving your enemies. To see that Jesus in this last sacred meal loved his enemies, the one who would betray him to death he loved. And maybe you just need to be reminded of the fact that Jesus loves you. And if he could love that scoundrel Judas, he could love you. And perhaps we just need to be invited to the table. This morning, if those who are going to serve would come, we're going to do communion a little bit different. I, I have a video that I'm going to show as, as we come to receive the elements and then we'll sing a closing song afterwards. But the communion supper was instituted by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and it is a sacrament which proclaims his life, his sufferings his sacrificial death and resurrection, and the hope of his coming again. It shows forth the Lord's death until his return. The supper is a means of grace in which Christ is present by the Spirit, and it is to be received in reverent appreciation and gratefulness for the work of Christ. All those who are truly repentant, forsaking their sins and believing in Christ for salvation, are invited to participate in the death and the resurrection of Christ. And so we come to the table that we may be renewed in life and salvation and may be one, made one by the Spirit. In unity with the church, we confess our faith that Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the sacred meal, the sacred table that you have invited us to. And today as we come to the table, would you speak to our hearts the message that you want us to hear as we sit at the table with you? Perhaps the message that we need to hear as we've talked this morning is the reminder that this is a special meal that we have been invited to. Perhaps this reminder that we need today is the reminder that we're to love our enemies and not pay so much attention as to who else is at the table. And perhaps the message that you have for us today is nothing to do with what I've said, but is something completely different that you want to speak into the heart of the person in this room. And just as conversations take place on the side and meals, would your spirit speak to us the message that you want us to hear today? And may we come to the table and receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is broken for us. And the cup signifies the blood of the new covenant. And may we be made one. May we be made whole in you. And may we remember this event. May we not forget the importance of this meal. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We'll ask that you come and come to the center aisle, receive the elements, and then take them back and hold them in your seat until we are finished. Again, the napkins are on the altar for you. And the video that we're going to play is a video called Come to the Table by the artist Sidewalk Prophets. And it's a powerful video, watch it at the corner of your eye as you're walking, to remember that we are all invited to the table.
know the shape that we were in And just when all hope seemed Body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance. And the blood of the new covenant, which was shed for you. Take and drink in remembrance. <coughs> and that to remind you that this is a special occurrence, a special time that we should remember. Well, I know that we're running a little bit over time, but in the story, they had to sing before they left. So we have to do the same. Let's stand together as we sing Jesus Messiah. <laughs>
just because we came to church, but because you invited us to the table. And may we as Christians today spend more time enjoying being at your table rather than spending time looking at others that we think shouldn't be there. May we enjoy your presence. May we slow down and see things with new eyes. May we enjoy knowing you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 And you are dismissed.